I want to welcome you into the service of the Lord and to prepare your hearts and minds as we get our spirits ready to contemplate the Word of God. You never complete the Word of God. You contemplate the Word of God. You never get to the end of it. You contemplate. In, in a few moments, we're going to contemplate 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. And I want you to go there with me as we contemplate what the Holy Spirit would have us to say out of this ancient writ about our contemporary dilemmas. Isn't that amazing how God can write something thousands of years ago and we can find things in it that are relevant to where we are right today. That's the kind of God we serve because we live in time but he lives in eternity and he has fashioned all things unto the continuity of his own divine will. Go now to 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1 through 7 and I'm going to share the word of the Lord with you. Can you say amen? Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah saying Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen or slaves. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaiden have not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. I want to read that again. Then he said, Go back. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, the ones that they were getting ready to take to pay off her bills, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, Mama, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? While you're standing, I want to pray with you as we contemplate what the Holy Spirit said to me to share with you is come empty. Come empty. Look at somebody and say, come empty. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today as we go into the word of God that we might experience all that you would have us to know and to understand regarding the truth and the integrity of the text. That we might extrapolate from this text the complexities of the revelation of who you are and what you require from us. We open our hearts and our spirits humbly and in a spirit of submission because we want to become more effective at coming into your presence. I ask you now in the name that has been exalted above every name that you would take these mere lips of clay, this flesh pot that I walk around in and transform it into an instrument for your own auspicious grace. And use me, oh God, if thou will, to be a blessing to somebody, to help somebody to better understand the necessity of coming into your presence and how you would have us to come and what you expect from us when we get there. I believe you for glorious things to happen 
while we explore and contemplate your word today. I believe you for miraculous moments of supernatural revelation to be extrapolated from the text while it is yet being preached. I believe you for moments of grace to reach my brothers and sisters around the country and around the world and that the text will be cut to the continuity of the challenge before us now. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. I don't even have to see you do it. I'll praise you on credit. I'll praise you now. You can do it later. I thank you for your blessing. Have your way in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. Say amen again. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is with great spiritual deliberation that we approach this, this text, not in the traditional sense of merely exegeting the text itself, though the text itself is extremely profound and it comes at a time that we watch a widow woman whose husband, now deceased, had formerly served Elijah as a servant, as a mentee as one who sought to better understand how to release his prophetic gift. It is interesting to note it because Elijah himself had once sought Elijah to better pull his gift out. And I can't help but notice that you always need somebody to help you pull out of you what God put inside of you. Having had that experience himself, as he served Elijah, he then had regiments of sons up under him that he trained in the ways of the Lord. And it is interesting to note that he had to be older than his mentees, and yet he had survived something that his sons did not. Hats off to every survivor out there who beat the odds who lasted longer than the records would have thought you would have been, that you are still effective at this age and at this stage in your life. So it was for Elisha because his, his mentee is gone, but the mentor is still standing. So we enter into this cross-generational conversation between not he and his successor or he and his son, but the wife of the successor now comes to him, reminding him that before he died, her husband was loyal to Elijah, that he was a son, as it were, that he was, that he was serious about God, and still he died. I have to pause there and know the fact that bad things do happen to good people. The woman is clear. When the wife says you're a man of God, you're a man of God. <laughs> Ain't no question about it. If anybody knows who you are, your wife does it. And it is clear he is a man of God, but that did not stop death. Death has this unreasonable ability to, to defy reason and pick and choose whoever it will, whenever he will, sparing not the young or the old. There is no guarantee because you are young that you will get to be old. Old is a gift given by God. It is not a promise espoused. To grow old, to live long enough to gray is a gift given by God. It is not a right that you can assume. So you have to live every day as if you might not make it to tomorrow. Such was the case with her husband. Never knowing that he would never finish raising his sons. That he and his wife would not grow old together. That he would not always be there as a force to provide and to protect for his family. Now the force is gone. The strength is abated. And the breath has gone out of his nostrils. And there's nothing left as evidence that he was ever there. Except for the cry of his wife. And the concern of his sons. His absence has left them uncovered. His absence has left them ill-prepared for the challenges of the time. And they have suffered not only the emotional toll of him being snatched out of the house, but also the economic impact because without him being there, the provider, the provision was gone. And little by little, the cupboards 
grew empty. And little by little, the pockets grew empty. And little by little, they started living off of promises that they could not fulfill. By the time Elisha steps on the scene, this woman's pockets are empty and cupboards are bare and the creditors are full and she's down to losing her sons. What kind of mama wants to give up her two sons to pay off her debt? So we know clearly that this was not the way she wanted her life to go, and yet this was where it was, and she was a woman of God. There are other widows in the Bible that, that it is not clear whether they were truly women of God or not, but this is a woman of God. But trouble will come to anybody. I don't care how you pray. I don't care how you fast. I don't care how you talk in tongues and dance all over the church. That does not exempt you from having dark days and empty days and days of tumultuous winds and complexities. We step into this woman's life, not during the good times, but the Bible does mention to us when things were, when the cupboards were full and the closets were overflowing and the pockets were overflowing with money. No, because that is irrelevant. God is showing us how to survive emptiness. She had lost everything. The only thing she has left is her son's. And she's about to lose them too. And Elijah comes on the scene and she reminds him who her husband was. My husband was your mentee. He went to your school of prophecy. He was a good man of God. And now he's gone. She's trying to, I believe, trying in some way to create some relationship with Elisha so that he has a vested interest in responding to her. She doesn't come in her name. <laughs> oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Because she doesn't have the clout in her name to provoke a miracle. But she knows whose name to call to get Elijah's attention. And she says, my husband was one of your spiritual sons. And he's dead. And I'm his wife. And they're about to come and get my son's. And Elijah says, what am I to do with thee? What, what do you do when you meet somebody in a particular slice of their life that threatens to define and deter the rest of their life? What do you do when you meet someone at a moment in time of desperation what do you do when they're expecting you to do something beyond human rationale? What am I to do with thee? And then he asked her a paramount question. I won't, I won't spend a lot of time contemplating it because it's not really what I'm out to today. But he asked her, what is in your house? And I think it's important to understand that God will always use something that you already got. <laughs> yeah, whether it's a pot of oil or a handful of meal or two fish and five loaves of bread, the miracles start out of normalcy. <laughs> miracles are birthed when God begins to magnify that which you have overlooked and thought was invaluable. And it might have been invaluable in your hands. It might not have been valuable in your hands, but it becomes invaluable when you place it in the hands of God. Uh, something as normal as the jawbone of an ass or two fish and five loaves of bread. Something that you've been walking past all the time. What the prophet does, his presence illuminates that which you have ignored. What do you have in your house? You telling me about what you lost. I want to know what you got left because God never uses what you lost. No. He's not interested in you giving him a litany and a list about who all left you and who hurt you and who forsook you. That's carnal talk. God doesn't need anything that you lost to bless you. God will always use what you got left. And she says, I don't have anything left. 
Listen at their discussion as they go back and forth bantering toward a miracle. As they banter back and forth toward a miracle, the Holy Spirit has only written for us those things that are necessary that our faith might be built up by eavesdropping on their conversation. This is not written to give us the historicity of this woman's life. God does not deal with her bank account during the time that she had a husband. God does not talk about her good days because faith does not shine in your good days. Faith always shines when all hell is breaking loose in your life. You You'll never experience the power of God when you're on the mountaintop. Who needs God on the mountaintop? You need God when you're in the valley and you're at your wit's end and you don't know what else to do. And I wanted to preach about this because I imagine in my own mind, allow, allow me to use my spiritual imagination to illuminate the text, I imagine in my own mind that she had spent many a sleepless nights. The Bible doesn't say it, but I know if they're about to take her sons, you don't go to bed when you're about to take my kids. She had had turmoil and discomfort, and she was stressed out and at her wit's end, and she said, I don't have nothing. I don't have nothing but a, a pot of oil. oil. I don't know what kind of oil it was, but it's just a pot of oil. It could have been bacon drippings for all I know. A pot of oil back in there. I'm out of everything. I'm empty, man. I got nothing. And then he says to the woman who is already in debt, go borrow. <laughs> go borrow. Did he not hear me tell him that I am in debt? Who loans to somebody that's in debt? I ain't got no credit. My credit score's down to 200. I don't have no credit. I can't get a car. I can't get a house. I can't get an apartment. My credit is bad. The creditors are coming to take my child. Now I use my children as collateral. I'm broke. And you tell me to go borrow. You have the nerve to tell me that I am not empty enough. I want you to hear that. I want that to sink into your head. That God is saying it's not bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets bad enough, you'll, you'll see my hand. When it gets bad enough, you'll see my glory. When it gets bad enough, you, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You don't have room enough to receive, but, 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 but what you're talking about is child's play. You talk about you in debt. God said, go borrow. <laughs> See, this is for radical people. This is not for your average, ordinary, superficial Sunday morning person who just happens to have clicked into the broadcast and you, you were just fooling around and you ran into me. This is not for you, no. This is for radical people who are backed in a corner and shoved to the wall and you don't have no choice but to believe God because if you don't believe God, you're going under. If you don't believe God, you're going down. If you don't believe God, you're going to lose your body. If you don't believe God, you're going to lose everything you got. If you don't believe God, you'll never get out of this. I want to talk to somebody who's in enough trouble to hear this message. Because some of y'all are doing too good to hear this message. Some of you got too much to get this message. Some of you are too intellectual to get this message. Some of you are too full to get this message. God is is best experienced from a place of vulnerability. <laughs> all of this teaching we're doing on praise and worship and, and how to get glory out of God and all that, all that's cute for people who are not in trouble. It only becomes sustenance when you are desperate enough for the word to come alive. Go borrow! go borrow from your neighbors. But it is not that he told her to go borrow. That is not 
what I really came to preach about. Uh, Sometimes when we start talking about making room for God and we start talking about economic impact and we start talking about God and finances, I'll talk about how sometimes your, your, your valley isn't deep enough to get God to let it rain. And sometimes you have to dig ditches in your valley in order to attract God because when God comes, he's going to come with such force that your little problem isn't deep enough to get him to flow in your life. And I don't have time to talk about that today. No, 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 no. That, 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 that's for another Sunday. But it's good to write down and to take note of that sometimes the only way to get out of trouble is to get deeper in the trouble. And you have to be desperate to receive that because if you're rational, you won't get that. You have to be desperate enough to throw in your everything and say, I ain't got nothing to lose. If I lose it, I'm going down anyway. I got nothing to lose. Oh, it is your nothingness that attracts God. It is your void. It's, it is the vacuum. It is the abyss of need in your life that attracts God. It is not your stuff. It is not your degrees. It is not your money. It is not your Gucci bag. It is your void somewhere down in your soul. Oh, God, somewhere down in your soul. You got to be empty enough to have a faith experience. You have to be vulnerable enough to have a faith experience. Jesus doesn't need to teach you how to walk when you're walking on concrete. It's only when you're walking on water. <laughs> you have to be vulnerable enough for God to get your full and undivided attention. God has this woman's attention. And he says, go borrow from your neighbors. Now, it's one thing to be broken. It's another thing to tell your neighbors you're broke. They're already talking funny. They're already looking at you. They're already noticing that the lawn is not manicured and, and the house needs paint. They already know that you haven't had a, a manicure and a pedicure. And they already notice that you haven't got your hair down. And God says, go tell your neighbors that you need something. And he doesn't tell you to beg for it in the sense of asking them to give it to you. He said, this won't take long, just borrow it. <laughs> when you hear the word borrow, it's like Jesus borrowing the grave. This won't take long. Just, just let me borrow it. I, I'm just going through some, this situation that you're in right now will not last you just need to borrow a solution because after a while, everything you lost is going to come back. Everything that got away is going to come running back. Everybody who walked off is going to come knocking on your door. This is a temporary situation. And he says, go to your neighbors and go knocking on doors with your sons that they're about to take. Send them out into the neighborhood. Now, when you borrow something. It has to have value. <laughs> Nobody that's listening at me right now goes up to a bag lady and ask her for a loan. <laughs> nobody, nobody goes into a trash can and says, I want to borrow some food. When you borrow something, there is a perceived value in order to go after it. And what God says he values is vessels. God says he values vessels. Why does God value vessels? When everybody else values content. God says, go borrow vessels. Everybody else goes to Neiman Marcus and they buy perfume. God says, go buy perfume bottles. Yeah. Don't nobody normally go down to the store to get a bottle. I don't want the bleach, just give me the can. God says borrow. God says uh, borrow vessels. And no, 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 he says, I want you to get 
empty vessels. In order to get your miracle, I'm not taking just any kind of vessel. Don't bring me a half full vessel. Don't bring me three quarters full. Don't bring me one third full. They must be empty to be eligible. Are you empty enough? <laughs> if you got one idea left, you're not empty enough. If you got a, a plan B and a backup plan and a contingency plan and a, and a plan C, you're not empty enough. God said, I want you to get vessels that are empty. And the reason the Holy Spirit sent me over into the text is not so much for the text itself. It is not the text itself that I am contemplating. It is the text against the times that we are living in. Because we are living in some times right now of emptiness. I'm wondering if there's anybody watching me that's been feeling empty. Now, 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 I must take the time to make a distinction between being empty and being tired. <laughs> If you are just tired and you get some sleep, you wake up in the morning and you feel better. But if you're empty, sleep will not resolve. It is there anybody who woke up feeling as bad as you did when you laid down. It's not that you're tired. It's that you're empty. And this message goes out. Oh, my God. To people who have been having this indescribable feeling that you don't even understand how to explain yourself that you have just seen so much and heard so much and, and watched so much and read so much and seen so much news and read so many texts and seen so many things tweeted and seen so many things happening in your personal life, in your financial life, in, in your public life, in our professional life that, and you, that so many people have been calling on you, asking for advice and for help and, and for encouragement to the point that it's not that I don't like you, but I saw it was your number and I didn't answer. Not because I don't like you. It's said I'm, I'm empty. I want to talk to some people who are just feeling empty. Not happy, not sad, just empty. <laughs> people keep asking you, how are you? and you can't even find a word to articulate how you've been feeling because you're not used to describing yourself as if your contents were gone because you've never been drained like you've been drained here lately and you are feeling empty. In psychology, they call it compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is when you have had so many disastrous things happen one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, that you run out of compassion. Now, it's hard to quantify compassion because we don't know where compassion stays. We don't know whether it's in our liver, our lungs, our heart, our tissue, our kidneys. We don't know where it stays, but we know when it's gone. <laughs> we can't describe if we could figure out where it stayed we could block them from taking it but little by little and day by day and hour by hour every phone call every situation every problem every dilemma has taken its toll and you run out of something that an accountant cannot account for that a lawyer cannot fight for that an agriculturalist cannot grow back you run out of compassion and now, you're empty. Empty is running out of care. <laughs> I don't care, yeah. I, I don't care. I don't care what I put on. I don't care what I look like. I don't care that I haven't shaved. I don't care that I haven't done my hair. I don't care that my nails are grown out. I don't care because I don't care because I spent all my care on you. And now, not only am I broke, but I've also run out of care. And now, 
I'm just empty. Empty is walking around with a sad face and nobody died. Empty is walking around without any kind of expression because you've run out of the energy that it takes to have an impact. Empty is letting the kids do whatever they want to do and you don't even say nothing because you're just empty. I'm tired of arguing with you. Go on and go wherever you want to go because mama is just, mama is just, Mama, it's just empty. I, don't, I ain't got no more. I ain't got no more. I don't have no more advice. I don't have no more energy. I don't have no more passion. I don't have no more drive. I am empty. Who wants to hire an empty person? You hire people for their creativity. You value them for their knowledge and their intellect. You hire people who have got passion and energy and insight and ideas. And God said, I don't want none of that stuff. I don't want ideas. I don't want creativity. I don't want passion. Go borrow me some empty. Can you imagine being the little boys who are about to be taken for debt and in a last surge of hope go knocking on doors and say, Mama said, can we borrow some empty? How do you fix your mouth to ask me for empty? I can see wanting a cup of sugar. I can see wanting a handful of meal. I can see wanting to borrow some soap or some dishwashing liquid. But your mama sent me over here, sent you over here to ask me for some empty. That's what the prophet told the woman that God valued. That God values you the most, not when you're full. <laughs> not when you're overflowing. Not when you've got all kind of creative impact and energy. That God values you the most when you are empty. You see, God creates empty. When, 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 in the book of Genesis, when, when, when he reached down into the earth and, and he formed man from the dust of the earth, he, he, he formed an empty vessel. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was careful. He didn't form it full. He formed it empty. And he wanted it to be empty so he'd have something to blow into. Y'all don't hear me. Out of the dust of the earth, an old clay pot, an old empty vessel called Adam, hallelujah, made of red earth. God shaped him and formed him, and then when he made him empty, then God was attracted to him. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, come empty. And so there God is. We see the master himself hovered over top of an empty vessel, as if he were an eagle hovering over an egg, as if he were about to hatch something. God came down from eternity, stepped over into time, and hovered over an empty vessel, and he was so attracted to it that he kissed the empty vessel, and when he kissed it, he blew in his mouth the breath of life, and he became a living soul. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but God is getting ready to kiss somebody. Hey! God is getting ready to kiss somebody who's been walking around for the last three weeks with an indescribable emptiness down inside of you, a void, a vacuum that nothing seems to fill. You're watching TV, but you're distracted. You're listening at the news, but you're only half listening at it. You're going through the motions you can't even re remember for sure. Is this Wednesday or is this Thursday? Is this, is this Friday or this Tuesday? You're just in time, but God is attracted to empty. And so he hovered over an empty vessel and he brew into it the breath of lives and it became a living soul. Later on, as we turn the pages of the Bible, we will see where God tells Moses on the mountaintop to go form a tabernacle. And Moses formed the tabernacle. And once he got the tabernacle all formed, then God said, fill it with furniture. And he began to fill that which was empty with furniture. And then when he made the holies of holies, God said, if you make the holies of holies and you make it empty, 
I'll come in and fill it with glory. And the glory was called Shekinah glory. Because God, God is, oh, I feel like preaching now. God is, God is attracted to empty. The question is not, are you full enough? The question is, are you empty enough? Because what God wants to come into his presence are not people who got it all together, are not people who got the hair all coiffed. God wants people to come into his presence who are empty. And the Bible said that if you are empty enough, God will fill you. Or let me say it this way, he that hungers and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. God said, I'm not going to feed you till you're hungry. I'm not going to feed you till you're thirsty because I am a God that is attracted to empty. Excuse me, I got to knock on another. Mama said, can we borrow your empty? <laughs> You want what, baby? Mama said, can we borrow your empty? Excuse me. My mama sent me over to your house to say, can we burn your empty? And door by door and house by house and neighbor by neighbor, the boys went out and all they gathered was empty. And they kept coming back to mama's house, bringing empty vessels, one right after another. The Bible doesn't tell us how many they brought, but the Bible does tell us that the oil didn't begin to flow until it found empty. There is a glory that God will only release on somebody who comes into his presence and you dare to come empty. I'm out of ideas. I'm out of concepts. I don't have nobody else to call. God said you're just right for me. Because what I've been waiting on you to do is run out. <laughs> and what I've been waiting on you to do is to run out of people to call and run out of people to trust and run out of people to explain yourself to and run out of people with ideas. I've been waiting on you to run out of yourself and run out of what was in your head and run out of your education and run out of your intellect and run out of your reservoir of scriptures and when, 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 when you get empty enough, I'm gonna come in your life and I'm going to fill you with the glory like you never had before. Somebody shall come empty. Mama said <laughs> that we need to borrow some of your empty. And house by house, and neighbor by neighbor, and person by person, they kept borrowing empty because my God is so big. It isn't a question, can he supply it? The question is, do I have enough empty to attract God's attention? Little by little, and house by house, and neighbor by neighbor, let me get enough empty. It reminds me of what Jesus did when he laid hands on the disciples and blessed them and told them to go to Jerusalem and said, don't start preaching until you're empty. And the Bible said that all of these disciples were in the upper room and they had not been filled with the Holy Ghost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one place with one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Yes! Cloven tongues appeared like as a fire and set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. If you want God to fill you, you gotta come empty. If you want God to bless you, you gotta come empty. If you want God to help you, you gotta come empty. If you want God to deliver you, you gotta come empty. Somebody shout empty. 
that's what he wants when you finally run out when you finally get empty when you finally run out of ideas and when the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one place with one accord suddenly suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind cloven tongues appeared like as a fire and they were all excuse me mama said excuse me mama said excuse me mama said on the day of Pentecost there were 70 souls and I'm just imagining in my mind that the two boys might have knocked on 70 houses to get enough empty vessels to get the oil to begin to flow and I heard the Bible say that after they had gathered enough empty vessels mama said come on in and shut the door now y'all are city folks y'all don't understand what it means for mama to say shut the door my mama didn't put up with you leaving no doors open and mama said you ain't living in no barn shut the door slap your neighbor and say shut the door Holler at your child and say, shut the door. This is a job for the Lord. We're going to be shut up in here together. We've been shut up for weeks. We've been shut up for months. We've been shut up in every city. We've been shut up in every neighborhood. But God said, shut the door. Shut the door. Something is about to happen. Shut the door. God is about to move. Shut the door. God is about to heal. I said, shut the door. So we are socially distanced. So we are confined to our houses and it's uncomfortable but the Holy Ghost said it's a sign that something is about to flow I want somebody to take 30 seconds and praise God for the flow shut shut the door Shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door. Shut the door on the news. Yeah. Shut the door on the paper. Shut the, Shut door. the door on your neighbors. Shut, Shut the, the door. door on your flesh. Yeah. Shut the door on your pride. Shut the door, Shut the door on your will. Shut the door. Oh. Yeah. Shut, shut, shut. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shut the door. God wants to be alone with you. Shut the door. This is a private moment between you yeah. and God. Shut the door. Shut the door. God don't need no outside witness. Yeah. Shut the door. Shut the door. And so, honey, when the door was shut, when the phone stopped ringing, when people stopped coming over, when the door was shut and there was no way out, when the door was shut, that's when God began to move. Look at how he moved. They brought the empty vessels to the pot of oil she already had. She knew it was a pot of oil. A pot of oil is measurable. It is finite. How much oil is it? It is a pot of oil. What is a pot of oil against all of these empty vessels? So she took a pot of oil. How much was it? It was a pot of oil. And she picked it up. And when the pot began to pour, the oil began to flow. 
it was a pot till she poured it. <laughs> See, you think you know what you got, but, 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 but you don't know what you got till you pour it. As long as you save it, you don't know what you got. You, you got it's in the process of pouring. I, you, you think you know what you can do? You don't know what you can do until you have to pour it out. It's when you're poor, you multiply. It's when you're poor, you got increase. It's when you're poor that you go from finite to infinite, to somewhere between uh, being straight up vertical uh, and being turned over horizontal. Uh, as the oil begins to flow, uh, it begins to multiply. And as long <laughs> as it had an empty vessel, the oil continued to flow. So the oil is not flowing in proportion to its container. It is flowing in proportion to the emptiness of what's in front of it. Y'all didn't hear what I said. Good God Almighty, you got a God! That the more you put in front of him, the more he'll begin to flow. The more you have a need, the more he'll have an answer. The more you knock, the more the door shall be open. The more you seek, the more you shall find. The more you ask, the more it shall be given. God is not limited by the containers we put him in. God is not limited to the churches we built. God is not limited to the size of our sanctuary. He said, let me show you how big I am. I'll shut the door. On your church. And it's funny, with the door shut, he flows more with the door shut than he did when the doors were open. Can I get a witness somewhere? And the oil began to flow. Look at somebody's telling me it's just beginning to flow. It's just beginning to flow. It's flowing in my living room. It's flowing in my kitchen. It's flowing in my house. It's flowing in my car. Anytime you shut the door, God said, I will flow. They shut the door in the upper room and God began to flow. They shut the door on Jairus' daughter and Jesus woke up the dead. They shut the door on Jesus in the tomb and he got up out of the grave whenever you set the door somebody said when you're opening up I said I don't know something is flowing with the door shut and as long as it's flowing I'm going to keep the door shut this ain't the time to open the door because something is flowing right now I feel it in my hands I feel it in my feet I feel it in my hand clap I feel it in my preacher I feel it in my soul I feel it in my spirit I feel it in my heart I feel it in my passion. Good God of God. Something is flowing. Somebody holler, let it flow. And the Bible said, the more they came empty, the more the oil began to flow. Take somebody and say, come empty. The secret to your next miracle is come empty. The secret to your breakthrough is come empty. The secret to your increase is come empty. That's why Jesus blessed the widow's might. The Bible said all the rich people gave an offering, but the widow gave all she had. And when God saw her empty, he said she's more blessed than anybody else because there's something about empty that God enjoys. Come empty, 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 and the more you come empty, the more the oil flowed, and they say mama was standing there, and she was pouring out the oil, and she said bring me another vessel, 
And when they ran out of empty, when they ran out of empty, the oil stayed. You know what's wrong with the church today? We have run out of empty. You don't come if the right person ain't preaching. <laughs> you don't come if you can't get a good parking space. You don't come if the choir ain't singing your song. You don't come till there's going to be a concert. You don't come till you're going to be on TV and you've been missing the point. It ain't about who's preaching. It ain't about who's singing. It ain't about who's leading the worship. Back in the old days, we didn't know who was preaching and we didn't care who was singing. And the folks who were singing couldn't sing and it didn't even matter because we didn't come to hear folks sing. We didn't come to hear flesh preach. We came laying on the altar and we came in if you come empty, God will fill your life. If you come empty, if you come empty, get rid of your gimmicks, get rid of your tricks, get rid of your flashing lights, get rid of your cute outfits, and come empty. Stop with your slogans, stop with your sayings, and lay out before God and say, I can't leave till you feel me. I can't let you go till you bless my soul. And so, the Holy Ghost told me, to tell you to come empty. Because if you come empty, he will flow. He will flow if you will come empty. Lift your hands up right where you are and open up your mouth before God. Because in our shot, God, God is looking for somebody who can come empty. He's looking for somebody who can come empty. I don't know what to do without you. I don't know where to go without you. I don't know what to say without you. I don't know what to think without you. I come as a fool. I come to the text as a fool. I come to your word knowing nothing. I have to come to the word empty to see something. I have to come to the altar thirsty for you to be water. I have to come hungry for you to be bread. And if you stop trying to act so full of yourself, yes, sir, and just lift your hands and open your mouth and be empty before him, there's an oil that's going to flow on you right now. Yes, sir, yeah, 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 yeah. Right there in your living room, right there by the bed, right there by the couch, if you just... If you just admit I'm empty, I'm tired, I'm run out, I'm, I'm dry, I'm thirsty, I'm barren. Fill my cup, Lord, I need, I need more of you, I need more. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. I can't do this without you. I'm, I'm empty. If you come empty, God will fill you. And when they ran out of vessels that were empty, the oil stayed. And Elijah told her one thing. He said, pay off all of your debtors and live off the rest. And I said, the rest? <laughs> you mean I'm going to have something left? You mean that if I come empty, I'll come into overflow? You mean if I come empty, you, my cup will run over and all my bills will be paid and all my needs will be met and all my questions will be answered? That if I come empty, if I come to the text as a fool, I'll leave with revelation. If I come to the text not knowing so much and not being so important, if I come and open up my Bible like a fool, I'll come into overflow. It would have been enough if you paid off my bills. I was only asking to break even. But God said, I'm not going to let you break even. I'm going to bring you in the overflow. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now. I don't know what you're going through. But whatever you got is too much. You need to give it. Whatever you're holding on to, you need to sow it. 
Whatever you think you know, you need to give it away. Because the Holy Ghost said, if you come empty, I'll bring you into overflow. This is a prophetic word in the life of some believer. You think you know something, you don't know nothing. You think you got something, you don't have nothing. Your problem is you're not empty enough. And if you empty yourself, the oil will flow. And God said, when all of the debt is paid, you'll have enough to live the rest of your life off. Shada Live off the rest, because I'm not coming back to your house. <laughs> this one miracle is going to do it. <laughs> when I get through blessing you, you'll be able to live the rest of your life off of the overflow. Somebody right now, God wants to bring you from hand to mouth, from paycheck to bill paying, into supernatural overflow. And all you got to do is... Mama said, <laughs> can we borrow your empty? Can you see this woman selling all the oil and giving back the vessels? <laughs> saying, Mama said, thank you. Here your vessel back. Mama said, thank you. We won't need it anymore. Mama said, thank you. We got it all worked out now. Mama said, thank you. Here's your vessel back. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Oh! Something that you used to need, you're about not to need it anymore. Mama said, thank you. You can have it back now. The bill is paid. I've come into overflow. We're living off of the rest. <laughs> As I close this message, I, wanna, I just want to live off of the rest I'm living off of the rest in God I went from feeling empty to feeling rested <laughs> I'm a rest in his promise I'm a rest in his grace I'm a rest in his word I'm gonna rest in his truth while my neighbors are going crazy while the world is going crazy while the economy is going up and down, while the government is going crazy, I'm going to live off of the rest. I'm going to rest in the rock of ages. I'm going to rest in the word of God because I found the secret to unlocking the overflow of God. All I got to do is come empty. God said, I'm going to shake this world till you come empty. I'm going to shake up all of your plans and all of your ideas and all of your circumstances and all of your situation till you get like your grandmama and get on the altar in a cheap J.C. Penny dress, hair all pulled back nappy-headed into a twist with a rubber band and lay out on the altar empty. And God said, when I see you empty, I'm going to do amazing things in your life. I'm going to do amazing things in your life. And I am going to save the next generation from the debt of their parents. I'm going to break the back of generational debt. Ah! I'm going to save the next generation if you have the courage to come empty. Somewhere out there, there's a prodigal son. There's a wayward girl. And you've been trying to get your life together and you said, when I get my life together, I'm coming to God. And what you don't understand is that if you get your life together, God ain't gonna want you. What God wants is for you to come empty and come broken and come confused and come crying and come strung out and come feeling kind of crazy and asking him to pick up the pieces. Right now, with every idea you had falling apart and friends betraying you and people walking out on you, God say, you just right, I want to borrow you. 
Mama said, God wants to borrow you. Your stuff ain't working. Your business ain't prospering. You're backed in the corner and shoved to a wall. God said, oh, good, good, good. You're finally right for me to use you. This is your moment. I want to invite you to Jesus, and I want you to come empty. I want you to leave all your degrees and come like a fool. I want you to leave all the stuff and the ideas and the plans and just come empty before him and say, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll give what you want me to give. I'm available to you. Right now. Lord, I'm available to you. Right now. This moment, right this minute. My I'll do, I'll do whatever you want. I'll, whatever you want. I don't care what you say. I'll do that. To show someone the way. I'll do it, Lord. And enable me to say. I don't need no front seat. I'll sweep the floor. I'll, I'll work in the parking lot. I'll do whatever, I, 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 whatever you, whatever you, however you, anytime, anywhere. It don't matter. I, I do. I don't have no opinion. I'm available to you. I don't have. No opinion, I don't have no preference. I'm through being smart. I come like a fool and I kneel down at the altar and I give you my life and I give you my plans and I give you my ideas and I give you my concepts and anything I got, you can have it. You can have it. You can have it. You can have it. I surrender all to Jesus. I surrender. I give up. I give, I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. Here, take all of this stuff back, all this worldly stuff, all this carnal stuff, all this fleshly stuff. You can have any of it. I come empty to you. And enable me to say, Lord, I want you to understand that right now my storage, my storage is empty and I'm available. And I am available. I'm available. Me, I ain't much, but I'm available. <laughs> Nobody else would see me as valuable but you, but but here I am. Lord, I'm available to you. Can I pray for you? My will I give to you. I'll do what you say do. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way and enable me to say right where you are right now mama said give me your empty and I am available to father right now in the name of Jesus as I bow my head I pray for every empty vessel every backslider every sinner every weary, worn out, exhausted saint. Every empty mama, every man walking around the house feeling empty right now. Every child that's lost his smile. I pray over empty vessels. I'm just asking you, Lord, to just let your oil flow. To cleanse every sinner of their sins, reclaim every backslider, fill every empty vessel that's watching this broadcast all over the world. Fill them till answers and creativity come back. Till power and integrity comes back. Till discipline and fortitude comes back. Fill I feel the oil flowing right now. I feel the oil flowing into your life and into your heart and into your spirit and into your mind and into your family and into your house and into your intellect and into your imagination. The oil is flowing. God just tilted. God just tilted the vessel. He just tilted. He just turned it up. He, can you receive it? Can you can, 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 can catch it? It's flowing. It's flowing. It's flowing. Catch. Catch. Open your mouth. Catch. 
My storage is empty, Lord. Let it flow. My storage is empty, Lord. My storage is empty. My storage is empty, Lord. My storage is empty, Lord. My storage is empty, Lord. My storage is empty. Somebody right now, you're standing on the verge of a miracle, and the Holy Spirit spoke something into your spirit for you to do. Obey him right now. Do what he said do. Sow what he said sow. Give what he said give. Plant what he said plant. Come empty. Come empty. Pour yourself out. I'm ready to come in the overflow. I'm tearing up my building plans. I'm tearing up my contract. I'm tearing up my concepts. I'm tearing up what I had in mind for myself. I don't want it to be me. I want it to be you. I don't want it to be me. I want it to be you. Feel me. I don't want it to be me. It's got to be you. Feel me. Feel me. Feel me. Feel. 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 Feel, 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 feel me. Feel my family. Feel my marriage. Feel me up. Feel my ministry. Feel me, feel me. Feel me up, Lord. Feel me up, Lord. Feel me up, Lord. All the way from the potter's house to your house. You can forget me, I'm not important. But don't you forget this message. The word of the Lord said, come empty. God bless you. Fill me up. <laughs>